Kicking off the list at number 10, laughing. Some of these lists are pretty messed up. We got chemicals that can melt your skin off, demon photos, haunted islands, you name it. I try and use humor whenever I can. Making people laugh is my favorite thing. Laughing is great and all, but do we even know why we do it? We pay to go watch movies or stand up comedy or improv to laugh. Most people will ask for their money back because they didn't laugh. It's the weirdest thing. Laughter isn't uniquely human. Rats also laugh when they're tickled, which is a fact I didn't want to know, but now since I do, you have to as well, courtesy of clicking my face. So far, we believe that laughing is done to promote pro-social behavior. Like when you're play fighting your siblings, you keep it light, you laugh, you don't just stare at them and aggressively, you know. It's also thought that humans evolve differently and they use laughter in different ways after our evolutionary split with other species. So next time you laugh at a joke, just wait a beat and then ask the group why they thought that was funny and start taking some notes, you know, really mix it up. Number nine. Itching. Okay, let's see if you can go this entire video without scratching yourself. Being itchy is the worst. My skin gets so dry in the winter, I look like a madman most of the time. Sometimes you feel an itch and it's a tiny bug and your arm hairs pick it up and your brain tells you something's afoot. But sometimes it's literally nothing. Nothing is on your skin, you're scratching, you're like, what is, why? There's nothing here. You ever get somebody to scratch a specific part on your back? There is no better feeling on the planet. Itches and pain also go hand to hand. Scratching offers relief to an itch because scratching causes pain. Pain blocks out the itch, but some painkillers also cause you to be itchy. So our brains are like, I don't really know what I want. It's, we don't know yet. I'm itching to know the real purpose here. It sounds like we've barely scratched the surface. Yeah, I'll, I have like four more. Number eight, hiccups. Hiccups are the absolute worst. Not only are they wildly uncomfortable, but they're also annoying. Even if you're by yourself and you get the hiccups, you still get embarrassed. You're like, oh, I hope no one can hear me. This is horrible. But why do we do this? How do we cure them? Make it stop, please. The way we handle hiccups still feels like the middle ages. It's almost like it's a joke. It's like yeah, hold your breath, maybe drink water upside down. Um, can I try scaring you? Maybe that'll work, like what? The only treatments for severe cases involve sedation and nerve stimulation. Nothing you can do nor want to do in the middle of math class. You just gotta deal with it. These involuntary diaphragm contractions cause your vocal cords to close and open briefly, which results in you sounding like a complete idiot. Like, <gasps> Sorry, we're good. Number seven, yawning. You ever yawn and then a little saliva shoots out of your mouth? Like you're a snake, like you're a sneaky snake all of a sudden? That's called gleeking. It'll catch you off guard. It's a little weird, but that's just your salivary glands doing their thing. The actual yawn itself, we don't totally understand to this day. We yawn when we're tired, but we also yawn the moment we wake up. What's going on up here? Also, why does seeing somebody else yawn make you want to yawn? Guy divers say they often yawn right before jumping, so it doesn't belong to the I'm tired category. Know what I'm saying? The purpose of a yawn remains a mystery. We used to think that yawning was our way of taking in large amounts of air to increase oxygen in our blood. But after a number of experiments done in 1987, that hypothesis was thrown aside. Also, I kept track of how many times I yawned while reading about this thing. Four times. Four times while typing this, I yawned. The brain's weird. Number six, immortal jellyfish. Creatures like the immortal jellyfish could be the key to advancing human life. Some people want to be Spider-Man, I would take immortality any day. It was said over 4,000 years ago to Gilgamesh that the secret to immortality lies in the coral reef on the ocean floor. And come 1988, German marine biologist Christian Sommer found it. It wasn't the trident of Poseidon, but instead, off the cliffs of Portofino, he discovered Triatopsis dorni, aka the immortal jellyfish. This is the Benjamin Button of the sea, okay? This guy was studying this creature and it literally started to age backwards in front of him. It was reversing the life cycle in front of his very eyes. They start off in their larval form, mature into polyps, which bud off into these tiny jellyfish. That's their life cycle. A jellyfish is usually the end of the life cycle. So one species of jellyfish has somehow changed that entire cycle, the immortal jellyfish, which is smaller than your fingernail, by the way, which I'll explain. It just shrinks itself over and over. It reabsorbs its tentacles, then having lost the ability to swim now, it sinks back to the ocean floor and then begins as a blob all over again. And for the next 40 hours, the blob develops into a new polyp and then its cycle starts back over and over. And then this thing just comes and dies and gets smaller and comes back again. Can we do this? I kind of don't want to, but I kind of do. Number five blue whales. The largest animal to ever live on Earth, coming in at around 330,000 pounds, give or take. The blue whale is hard to miss, but even so, scientists have found it incredibly difficult to observe slash describe their sex life. Blue whales usually travel solo, but come late July, early August, they begin to pair up. They don't just mate on the spot, and then, you know, Bob's your uncle. Blue whales almost date for a while. Richard Sears, marine researcher, says that they'll travel for weeks, with mating not being a foregone conclusion. We still have no idea how females choose a mate 
date also. Sometimes another male will just join in and then they'll almost race each other in the water to see who's the fastest. That's definitely an option. There's also another theory that blue whale vocalizations have some sort of reproductive function. So you gotta spit that game, even in the ocean. Number four, hammerhead sharks. We haven't acknowledged how insane hammerhead sharks look. I mean, like really look at this thing. Why is its head a hammer? They look like sea vacuums. This is insane. There are nine species of hammerhead sharks. Their name coming from the Greek word of hammer, sphyma. Most sharks have a pointed head, right? They're aerodynamic, but not this guy. Dude's poking his eyes out all day long. Also, in case you're wondering, when they're born, their heads are round. They have to mature into their hammer eyes situation. That must be a pretty wild time. Imagine your eyes just slowly drifting apart as you grow up, like a sloth. I'd be so concerned. They're also one of the only creatures in the animal kingdom that can get a tan from sun exposure. Hashtag tan lines. The most compelling theory so far about the hammerhead shark is that it evolved to increase its electrosensory area. Kind of like how my neck evolved to let me see over people at concerts. Nature finds a way. Number three. Homing. This one I've wondered since I was a wee young lad. You see birds flying overhead, they're in a flying V, they're heading south for the winter. The approaching cold weather motivates them, but really it's the food supply around them that determines when moving day really is. That's pretty normal in the animal world. That's natural instincts. But we still can't figure out homing exactly. See, homing is the ability to, well, navigate home, all the while traveling through unfamiliar landscapes. Homing pigeons were used in both world wars, with several being awarded medals for their service. A pigeon. Got a medal. Oh, it's poor neck. It would have been so heavy. A little different than the pigeons we have in our city today. They're just fat and covered in mayonnaise. We still don't know exactly how homing pigeons navigate these thousand mile trips. If you have ornithophobia, odds are it's probably because of a pigeon. They're always watching. Number two, deja vu. There's a couple theories for this one, so let's just dive in. The hologram theory is fun. Basically, it's that our memories are stored in the brain like holograms, literally like the movie Inside Out. And that's pretty close. Just these pockets of information that are floating in our subconscious, and just one small fragment is needed to remember an entire event. Just like a keyword that unlocks memory. Sometimes this sneaks up on you when you're experiencing something entirely new. You may see something or smell something that feels familiar and that's when the have I done this before feeling comes out. You fail to recognize the trigger word that spawns that sense of familiarity but deep down your brain still knows. Leaving you feeling like you're having a premonition and all your friends are in danger. You're like I think this has happened before. Nobody move. There's also divided attention theory. This happens when all of our attention is on one specific thing. Maybe you're at a Beyonce concert and you're like wow she's 40. Can you believe that? Your focus is on the stage but your brain is subliminally processing your surroundings and the girl dancing off beat in the next section. So later on after the show, she's on the same train as you heading home, but you don't realize it. You have this sense of familiarity, but you don't know why. It's because offbeat Becky was triggered in your brain sitting over here. We still haven't figured out deja vu entirely. Like I said, these are just theories. Deja vu is so weird. Honestly, I think I'm getting it right now. I feel like you're about to hit the thumbs up. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, yeah. And number one, crying. Okay, we'll save the tearjerker for last. A good amount of scientists believe that crying, like emotional crying, like sadness, was a way for our ancestors to communicate sadness at a close distance without being vocal, right? You know how some people say they can cry on demand? Well, that's the exact idea. To signal, right? Many believe this was the start of humans developing emotions. Now in the Middle Ages, crying was quite risky. You let a few teardrops and they fell from your left eye while the whole town would think that you were a witch because witches can only shed three tears from their left eye. It's also been proven that crying expels toxins, but the exact reason why we feel like crying during a sad movie, well, that still remains a mystery. Kicking off the list at number 10, Alzheimer's. Roughly 500,000 new cases of Alzheimer's are diagnosed each year. Whenever we hear about somebody developing it, more often than not, they're older, right? We often make jokes if someone forgets something like, oh, well, you're getting older, Alzheimer's are kicking in. It's, you know, it's common at this point, but we still don't know why or where it comes from. Alzheimer's is an irreversible degeneration of the brain that causes disruptions in memory, personality, cognition. Every three seconds in the world, somebody develops dementia. Annual healthcare spending adds thousands if you're suffering from Alzheimer's, and more than 16 million Americans are providing unpaid care for somebody with Alzheimer's right now. It's the fifth leading cause of death for those 65 and older. There's early onset and late onset Alzheimer's. There's two categories. There's no cure for either. Scientists are still trying to figure out what causes the disease, but so far, a leading theory is that Alzheimer's is caused by a pileup of these proteins called amyloids, which harm the brain. This is a theory, but medicine that clears amyloids from the brain aren't doing the trick. Hopefully in a future video, we break down the cure to Alzheimer's, but until then, Alzheimer's remains a biological mystery, hence why we're here. Number nine, but why? And then I talk about holes right after. We'll try and lighten up the mood here just a little bit. Here's a fun fact. Scientists aren't sure why we have an anus, a butt, the whole he We're so obsessed with them in pop culture and we don't even know why we have them. Yeah, next time Sir Mix-a-Lot sings about liking big butts, somebody pull him aside and just ask him why, you know? Be like, Mr. Mix, why do you like big butts? Why can't you lie about them?
Catherine Rue, science writer from The Atlantic, explains more of this biological mystery in their study titled The Body's Most Embarrassing Organ is an Evolutionary Marvel. Great title, kind of nailed them more. Before the anus came around town, animals would eat and excrete through the same way. <sighs> they would just mm, and then spit it out. Then all of a sudden, butts come into the mix, the sir mix a lot, and now animals can become bigger, stronger, and stinkier. We still have no idea which creature had the first anus. That's a sick title, I want that. I really want that. The first guy with a hole. It's like, look at this dude, look at this little caterpillar. Little I have an ass dude. Catherine Wu explains in that report, which I highly recommend that you read for yourself, of course I did after reading that title, she said that it's hard to study something that must be millions of years old and also doesn't fossilize. Yeah, there's no bones in your butt, that'd be, that'd be weird, it's a big old hard butt. I've talked about butts too much, let's just put this behind us, you know? Leave it in the rear, put it up our, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of puns, let's move on. Number eight, Ebola's origins. I know we're all a little preoccupied with some other stuff right now, but here's another fun mystery to add to that list. Ebola, we're at the point now with Ebola that we're treating monkeys. We're out of the woods for the most part, panic-wise, but scientists are still trying to figure out where this thing even came from in the first place. The first known case of Ebola occurred in 1976 in Sudan in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Over 600 people got sick and now come 2005, we're trying to find its origins. More than 1,000 animals in Central Africa were tested. We tested 679 bats, 222 birds, 129 small vertebrates, and the only animal found with Ebola was bats. Specifically, three types of fruit bat. It's still unclear whether bats are reservoirs for the virus or if this was a bat infection that also affected people. Hence the mystery. We're still trying to figure that out, believe me. Number seven, the appendix. Been around for quite some time, that's for sure, but are we even sure why we have an appendix anymore? This organ causes a lot of discomfort. More often than not, you'll have it removed and it's now a standard procedure. It's so common, but why is removing an organ from your body common? Why are we just like, oh, you're doing that thing? Great, I've heard about that. That's your time. No, this is weird. We're taking a thing out of our body, like, and then stitching it, ugh. Well, what scientists do know about this whole process is that our plant-eating ancestors for sure needed it. They needed an appendix for digestion, but cut to us, we still have it because we're at that point in evolution in the middle where we don't need it anymore. That's the leading theory here. But another theory that's more recent is that we have two types of bacteria in our colon. A lot of ass talk in this one. The nasty type causes infections and harms tissues and all that bad stuff, but other types of bacteria are good, as odd as that sounds. It doesn't harm the colon, and when the subject takes antibiotics, they get rid of bacteria in the colon. The appendix job is to store good bacteria when the colon is being flushed out. That way, the good stuff can still stay in control. Still mysterious, but the brilliant scientists at the University of Arizona are getting to the bottom of it. I had one more pun. I waited for this one. There we go. Now I'm done, I swear. Number six, blushing. Okay, picture this. You're standing near your locker. It's high school. Blake rolls up on some Heelys, does a cool hockey stop. Everybody looks over. He puts his longboard to the side, pulls out flowers, and Roller Blake is now asking you to prom. You immediately start to blush, right? You're feeling all that hot, panicky. Your face gets hot. This is a sign of embarrassment, or you're happy, or you're confused. Uh, what is blushing, and why is it so damn obvious all the time? Let's talk about it. The origins of blushing, and whether or not humans started doing it to maximize personal gain is the true mystery here. Charles Darwin was scratching his head over this. Why do humans call their own bluff when they lie? but animals don't. One leading theory is that humans did it to submit authority, but over time, as our social interactions changed and became more complex, blushing was a behavioral trait that represented guilt or embarrassment. Scientists have noted that women blush more than men, and we think it's because women would usually show their honesty to men by blushing, right? We're looking at this in a reproductive, animalistic way. They would blush so that they can produce an offspring. That's like the OG origins, but the other stuff we still don't know about. Hence the mystery, hence this list. Number five, lying. Okay, I think it's time to admit that we all lie. Just a little. Kanye West lies in jail part two. We all liars. So good. Robert Feldman, University of Massachusetts psychologist, he words it really well. He says when it comes to white lies, we're trying not so much to impress other people, but rather to maintain a view of ourselves that is consistent with the way that they would like us to be, which is a great way of saying I just lied to you. I'm gonna start using that one next time I bail on my friends and they get mad. I'm just gonna be like, look guys, I wanted to come, but I needed to uphold the way that you view me as the guy who always bails last minute. Just gotta keep it going or else who am I, right? If I didn't bail, then I'm a liar. Like, what's, what's your really, what's your true agenda? We don't know exactly why we lie, but it starts when we're young. Children start lying at the age of four to six. Now this, weirdly, is a good thing. This means that they're learning. Humans lie to avoid hurting themselves or to avoid getting in trouble. But it's not always primal. Sometimes we lie to make others feel better. That's the mystery. Of course that turtleneck looks good on you. Number four, dark thoughts. Okay, we'll get a little darker for this one. We've been a little silly, now we'll get back to the 
Hmm, vibe. But humans, thinking about what happens to them after they die, despite how it feels, it's a normal thought. We read books about dreaming and we try and piece together every little thing that we remember, but like I talked about in part one, dreaming is also still a mystery here as well. The brain is fascinating and we're at least a little curious what happens to it after we die. From time to time, humans think of their own death. You'd be lying there at night and you're like, oh, if I was in a hospital right now, who would who would come see me? It's like, is it, is it weird? Is it bad? Is it a bad sign? No, it's, it's pretty normal. Pellin Casabir, scientist and psychologist at the Center of Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, believes that thinking about your own inevitable death causes anxiety for some, but others think about dying as immense clarity and wisdom. I've heard it's exactly like before you were born. If that's the case, sign me up, because I don't remember paying for my phone before then. You know what I mean? No bills before that. Just darkness, a lot of sleep, no food, and no bills. Good time. The mystery here is why we so commonly daydream of our own death. That's the what I'm really talking about here. Do you think animals had that same thought? Or are they too focused on eating and surviving to daydream who would show up at their funeral? Humans are strange. Number three, hair. To be specific, we're talking about hair you know, down in the southern, southern regions. The southern regions, the southern, southern, south, hair down, pubic hair, we're talking about pubic hair. Pubic hair is a biological mystery, and yes, even after we hit puberty, we still can't figure it out. Of course, we have many theories, but no definitive answers. So far, we believe this is a part of our evolutionary history, and it comes from a time where humans needed fur all over their bodies. Robin Weiss, the University College London, made a pretty remarkable observation. At some point, our pubic hair became thicker than the rest of our hair, hair in our body. That's the mystery here. Our best guess is protection against cold or to protect the genitals during intercourse or to prevent chafing from running around and doing parkour and all that stuff, all the normal stuff. Pubic hair, still a mystery. Number two, the basking shark. Pubic hair and sharks, we got it all. Okay, on part one of this list, I went in on hammerhead sharks. A bit too hard, I'll admit, with the, with the goofy eyes. I'm doing it again, I called them goofy, sorry. If you're a hammerhead shark, my bad. So on part three, I have to shine the light on another shark, the basking shark. The basking shark translates to large nose sea monster and honestly, yep, pretty much nailed it. They swim through the surface of waters and search for tiny little food, plankton to be specific. Despite how big their mouths are, yeah, they eat plankton. They're just like, ah, and they eat dust, it's crazy. We'll go years without seeing one of these guys, but once we do, we're in luck because more often than not, basking sharks travel in large numbers, found in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. As of 2019, basking sharks were considered endangered. Overfishing, of course, is to blame for that one. The biological mystery here, and this one is not her giant mouth, of course, but the fact that the basking shark females only have one functioning ovary, and it's the same every time. It's always the right one. Mystery. Yeah, the big mouth part is not the mystery you thought, eh? You really thought I was gonna say, no, that's normal, that's just, that's just shark stuff. Hashtag just sharky things. And finally, number one, blood types. A, B, AB, and O, those are the four main blood groups. Each can be RHD positive, and each can be RHD negative. So there's actually eight groups in total. O positive is the most common, while AB negative is the most rare. If you're AB negative, congratulations, you're rare and your blood is rare. Now I'm starting to sound like a vampire. When donating blood or receiving it, you need to know which type of blood you need, of course. It's important that you know which type of blood that you need. Different types fight off different infections. Now scientists believe this began around 20 million years ago. Just like the appendix, this mystery kicked off long before us. We don't really know why blood types change among us. And the reason that we're A positive or B negative, like many things in the series, is a biological mystery. Dr. Mohamed Mobayed of Promedica Hematology and Oncology Associates explains on thehealthy.com that natural selection would provide unique blood types to beat specific infections. So if you're ever wondering why our blood type is different even in your family with the same genes, well, get in line. Lots of scientists are still trying to figure this one out. Number 10, fingerprints. Your prints are so unique that Apple trusted them as a security verification. Apple Wallet, Touch ID, that stuff was game changing. Unless you had their thumbprint, you couldn't get into anyone's phone. It was pretty unique. Your thumbprints are unique, but also they're quite mysterious. The biological function of fingerprints, these ridges on our fingertips, is not understood yet. There's one theory about how it improved grip underwater. I myself was like, we used to come from the sea and stuff. We're like Atlanteans, that's why our fingers get that. No, it's been sadly disproven. The only theory we have left is that they help improve our touch perception, but perception is a whole other thing. I'll dive into that later on, as you guessed in this list. Number nine, right or left. 90% of people are right-handed, and we still can't figure out why. Left-handed people, they just can't seem to stop talking about it. Scientists are still unsure how it develops, what purpose it serves, if there's even one in the first place, and why one is much more common than the other. So far, our leading theory has to do with our spinal cord and not actually our brain. Other research done back in the 80s found that our handedness is determined before we're even born. Whichever thumb you just happen to suck on in the womb, 
that's the one you're stuck with for life. It was also thought that genetic differences between the right and left hemispheres of the brain has something to do with it. They studied gene expression of the spinal cord around the 12th week of pregnancy, and they found that left and right segments control arm and leg movements and all that jazz. But again, since lefties are so rare, we've evolved as a right-handed majority. So if you're a lefty, you're rare. And you know what? You deserve to talk about it. Hit that thumbs up if you're there. Number eight, walk the line. German scientist Jan Suman discovered that humans, as fascinating as we are, we can't walk in a straight line, sober or not. His test subjects were blindfolded and then told to simply just walk straight for an hour. The subjects all ended up walking in a massive circle, or circles, somewhere tall. Like, I'm 6'2", I could walk circles. I would do donuts there if I was there. This was done at the beach, the Sahara Desert, these massive open areas, of course, you didn't bump your head or bump into anything, but still, circles over and over. So the next step was to remove those blindfolds and see what happens. But even so, the subjects still continued to walk in a circle. It was cloudy out, so although you could see where you were walking, you couldn't exactly keep track of which direction you were going. That's the mysterious part. Number seven, turn it up. Okay, you're sitting in a car full of friends, you're in the back seat, an absolute banger comes on, and at the same time, everybody yells just to turn it up. That's a good day, especially if you're riding shotgun and you're the guy with the ox, that's a good feeling. You want people to love your choice in music, but why? Same thing with DJs, you really need somebody who can read a room to have a memorable wedding, but still we can't figure out why humans enjoy music in the first place. The music industry makes billions of dollars a year. I mean, look at Kanye West, for example. People bought enough tickets to a stadium for a listening party. The guy made 12 million off those listening parties that you saw on Twitter. Like what compels us to spend this much money on concerts even? Our right temporal lobe is activated when we listen to music, so that of course has something to do with it, but as a whole, music is addicting. A study done by McGill College in the early 2000s found that the part of our brain activated when using narcotics, eating junk food, having sex, is the same as when we hear music that we like. What we get from music has nothing to do with survival mechanisms like eating or mating, we simply just enjoy jazz. Number six. How old can we go? So far, the oldest human that has ever been was Gianna Kalman. She was born in 1875 and she passed away in 1997. They were 122 years old for all those who can't do quick math. Can you believe that? I mean, there's since been a few articles that try and debunk her story, but after her, Jiraman Kimura lived until he was 116. So still, we're getting there. The human lifespan has risen over time and we're at the point where scientists are unsure if there's even going to be a cap. Scientists believe we could live up to 150 pretty soon. 150, they think 120. 20 to 150 will be the new average down the road. Humans are getting too advanced, so who knows? Back in the day, the average lifespan was 25 years in ancient Greece, so only time can tell. Technology is definitely helping. Even if you were in great shape that entire time, would you want to live to 150? Comment down below. Number five slime mold. This is, ugh, this is disgusting. It doesn't sound very smart, but slime mold is honestly pretty terrifying. This brainless mold that you see covering tree stumps, it's been around for a while now. It's bright yellow and it's a single celled organism and they pretty much when it comes together, despite being brainless, they all seem to think and act as a unit. Rumor has it, this mold can smell and pulsate its way to find food. It's just this long network of veins, these veins of protein that push nuclei around. There's a time-lapse video of slime mold finding the shortest path between food sources in a maze and it's haunting number four dreams have you ever had a dreams that that you um you had you 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 could you i will never get tired of that video but i will get tired in general right and then hopefully tonight i'll have good dreams right that's the goal that's what any of us want to do we just want to avoid nightmares just pay your bills and don't have nightmares that's really all you can ask for after you watch a scary movie you always have to watch something nice before bed because you're trying to not dream but being you know attacked by snakes on a plane it's a lot of fears and just that one dream snakes planes fire the whole thing not for me i'm tapped out we still don't know for sure why we dream and considering how much time we spend doing it i feel like we should know more about that missing third of our lives that's another thing too dreams only last two hours but i feel like i am in a lifetime when I'm in there. I have like six dreams a night. When I wake up, I could remember all of them for about an hour. It's kind of disturbing. I have to Google a lot of them. Yeah, we have to Google dreams. That's how much this shit matters to us. And we still can't really explain most of it. Dreams consolidate memories and they process emotions and they allow us to gain practice confronting potential dangers. Those are really the only things that we understand about them. But there's also scary things that are just, I don't want anything to do with that at night. Like the hypnic jerk. It's also not a TikTok dance. That's that feeling you get when you're falling asleep and then it feels like you're falling off a building all of a sudden called the hypnic jerk. That's awful. I could really go without that. Dreams are weird. Let's move on. Number three, 
placebo effect. One time I drank some Long Island iced tea mix, like just a mix, not alcoholic and then I thought that I was tipsy. This was like a high school party and I was drinking a bunch and I was like, oh man, this is some good stuff. And they're like, what are you talking about? It's juice. Why wouldn't that be good, Taylor? I fooled myself. I legit thought that I was getting loose at this party, but really it was just the placebo effect. The placebo effect is psychological and physical. It's a tricky one. Patients would think that they were feeling better, leading to this mysterious list that we're on, of course, now. When you take a placebo, a tic-tac that somebody told you was a pill, your brain will believe it and then it will release endorphins and naturally, you'll literally feel better. Yeah, humans are complex. We have an explanation for the placebo effect with us somewhat, but animals, turns out they can also experience a placebo effect as well. One study in particular was on a placebo effect for dogs and their epilepsy being treated. Some factors that stuck with me with the placebo effect is that you can get one even if you know that you're still getting a placebo. You know what I mean? Someone can say, hey, this isn't medicine. It won't make you feel better. It's just a Tic Tac. Boom. And then you can eat it. And then somehow through this process and all your brain stuff, you'll feel better. Isn't that the craziest you've ever heard? There's layers to this. The geniuses at Walden University are currently figuring it out. So stay tuned. Number two life. Yeah, here's a fun thought. How did life begin? Who are we? What's going on? Why do I have to pay bills now? I was just born. Now I exist. The origins of life began billions of years ago. We began as microbes, but how did living, breathing organisms really come about? Some theories are fun. Others are disturbing. It's one of those things you really don't want to think about for too long. This whole list actually is. Lightning is theorized to be a main player here in the origins of life. We know that electricity can generate sugars and amino acids in atmospheres made of water, ammonia, methane, hydrogen, all that good stuff like we have on Earth. This was the Miller-Urey experiment from 1953. There's a chance that we came from lightning. Cool. Thor ancestry. We love it. Another theory is that life originated in the deep sea vents. Little Aquaman stuff. Okay. Either or. Kind of exciting. These hydrothermal vents are chock full of hydrogen rich molecules. Add a little pressure. Literally the surrounding rock could help then form mineral catalysts supporting ecosystems. We came from the lightning or the sea. I don't know. I'll take it. And finally, number one, deformed mountain lion. I wanted to end on something really out there. So here we go. In 2015, a hunter from Idaho saw this mountain lion attacking a dog. The hunter shot and killed the mountain lion, which is sad and all, and everything was legal and all that stuff, in case you're wondering. But upon closer inspection, the mountain lion had fully formed fangs growing out the top of its head. Yeah, like something out of a horror movie. This baffled scientists, as it's probably baffling you right now, as it baffled me when I wrote this list. Their best guess is that it's the remains of conjoined twins, and one died in the womb and was later absorbed by the surviving fetus. That, or it's possibly a teratoma tumor. Those can contain hair and fingers, and teeth and toenails, just all that fascinating natural stuff. The exact cause is still up in the air. How's that for number one? Gross. Starting with number 10 now, we have David Reamer. When this Canadian man was born in 1965, he was sent to be circumcised, but the doctors experimented with an unconventional technique and ended up removing David's entire penis. Now, doctors told his parents the best solution would be to give him a sex change operation right there and then, raise him as a girl, and never let him know the truth. This ended up tearing his parents apart, and his dad told David the truth when he was 14. David then chose to get a reverse sex operation. It was a success. However, David struggled a lot with the events of his past and ended up committing suicide at just 38 years old. At number 9 now, we have the chimp baby. In the 1930s, a scientist called Winthrop Kellogg thought a chimp could grow up to be like a human if it lived alongside a human baby, his own son. For 9 months, he conducted experiments and his son Donald was inseparable from the chimp called Gua. They ate together and they played together. They noticed that Gua was picking up more and more human tendencies from Donald than ever before, but the experiment came to an abrupt halt when Donald, the human baby, began to regress and become more like a chimp. Apparently, he would just sit there howling and wailing and would struggle to pick up even basic language like a normal human baby. The experiment was stopped immediately. All right, at number eight now, we have the monster study. This 1939 experiment was conducted on 22 orphans to see how children responded to positivity and negativity when it comes to speech therapy. Half the children were praised for their efforts, while the other half were teased and belittled for their speech imperfections. Many of the children who received this negative feedback went on to suffer serious psychological damage for the rest of their lives. It was so bad that some of them could barely even speak again. The monster study got its name from its shocking experimentation on orphan children just to prove a hypothesis. Alright guys, coming in at number 7 now, we have 
Dusko. This one was just messed up, if I'm honest. In 1962, when the CIA was absolutely obsessed with finding out the effects of LSD, they experimented on an elephant with the help of the University of Oklahoma. The elephant, called Tusco, weighed three and a half tons and was given enough LSD to make 3,000 humans hallucinate. The CIA were trying to see if they could make the elephant enter must, which is a naturally occurring state where elephants become violent and uncontrollable. The experiment was a total disaster. Trusco almost immediately collapsed and had a seizure for almost two hours before finally dying. At number six now, we have the Stanford Prison Experiment. This psychology experiment conducted by Stanford University involved splitting 24 random students into two groups. One group were the prison guards and the others were their prisoners. This was set up for them to study how power and authority works within human groups, but it got really, really messed up. It was supposed to last two weeks, but had to be stopped after just six days because the guards began to abuse their power. They would emotionally and physically abuse the prisoners. After just the first day alone, the guards were already attacking them with fire extinguishers. Yeah. Some of them suffered serious mental and physical injuries for life. Moving on to number five now, we have the yellow fever experiment. Dr. Firth was a scientist who was trying to prove that yellow fever was not contagious and was actually due to the difference between summer and winter. Now, in an effort to prove this, he tried to infect himself with yellow fever by drinking the vomit of victims. He also injected it into his body and even poured it onto his eyes. Well, it turns out he was right about the whole seasonal thing, but for the wrong reason. It's mosquitoes that are the ones who spread yellow fever and they hibernate in the winter. So, all the vomit drinking and pouring in the eyes was for nothing. At the number four spot now, we have testicle radiation. In 1963, researchers offered prisoners in the Washington and Oregon area $25 to participate in reproductive radiation tests. Now, they were told they wanted to see how a normal dose of X-ray level radiation would affect a man's testicles. Instead, they hit them with about six times that amount of radiation. The prisoners, as you might expect, developed testicular cancer, they became sterile, and had many other health problems. The class action lawsuit only gave gave $2,000 to each of the victims. We're at the number three spot now and we have TGN1412. This was the name of an experimental drug used to treat leukemia. As with most drugs for humans, it was first tested on animals to see if it was non-fatal. It wasn't. In fact, everything was fine with the animals. They moved on to testing the drug on humans and just to be safe, they gave them a dose 500 times lower than the level found safe in animals. Six of the test subjects were hospitalized with massive organ failure. The trial was stopped and researchers started to work on why this drug was fine in the animals but almost killed six humans that it was given to. Moving on to number two now, we have the Guatemala syphilis experiment. This experiment involved US backed Guatemalan doctors infecting soldiers, prisoners, and prostitutes in Guatemala with syphilis in order to study it. They wanted to see what the effectiveness of penicillin was on syphilis, except they only used penicillin on about half of the 1,308 people involved in the study. At least 83 people died, and 63 years later, President Barack Obama apologized on behalf of the US to the Guatemalan president. And finally, at number one now, we have MK Ultra. This CIA experiment was conducted in the 50s and the 60s in an effort to see if LSD and other drugs could mind control people. They tested the drug on countless unwitting citizens. Some of them weren't even American. Many of them suffered life altering mental conditions and became very unstable. Those that tried to speak out about what happened met mysterious deaths such as suspicious suicides. Not surprisingly, most of the documents involved with these shocking experiments were later destroyed. Starting off at number 10 now, we have the Manhattan Project. Some of you guys may recognize the name of this one. It was the secret name for America's project to produce the atomic bombs that brought World War II to an end. Harry Daglian was a young physicist who worked on the project. During an experiment on August 21st, 1945, he was attempting to build a neutron reflector manually by stacking a set of 4.4 kilogram tungsten carbide bricks in an incremental fashion around a plutonium core. Unfortunately, he dropped a brick which set off a chain reaction. He tried to stop the reaction, but by the time it was over, he received a high dose of neutron radiation. Harry received intense medical care for severe 
severe radiation poisoning. His mother and sister even flew out to New Mexico to care for him, but Harry fell into a coma. He died 25 days after the accident. His death resulted in new safety regulations when handling radioactive material. Next up at number 9 now we have the dioxin tests. In 1965, dermatologist Dr. Albert Kligman conducted a study on behalf of the US Army and some pharmaceutical companies. They wanted to know how human skin reacts to harsh chemicals, a process known as hardening. Most of the information about these tests has since been destroyed or just covered up. We do know that he described his patients as acres of skin to experiment on. We also know he used dioxin on them, the active ingredient in Agent Orange. This happened around the time the US was covering Vietnam with Agent Orange in an attempt to push the fight against the Viet Cong in their favor. To speed up the experiments, Dr. Kligman injected his victims with a reported 468 times the recommended safe dose of dioxin. After that, not much more has been uncovered. It's thought there are still about 70 of the patients out there still. Their identities and current condition are known. Next up at number 8 now we have Operation Sea Spray. In September 1950, the US Navy spent 6 days spreading the bacterium Suratisha Marci Sens into the air about 2 miles off the coast of California. That bacterium lives in soil and water and is best known for its ability to produce a bright red pigment. This trait makes it useful in experiments because it's so bright it's very easy to see where it is. The project was called Operation Sea Spray. Its aim was to determine the susceptibility of a big city like San Francisco to a bioweapon attack by terrorists. In the following days, the military took samples of 43 sites to track the bacteria spread. They found that it had infested the whole city and all the surrounding suburbs as well. During the test, residents of San Francisco inhaled millions of bacterial spores. The military deemed the experiment a success. They got to see how far chemical warfare could spread, and anyway, they knew the bacterium wasn't harmful, or so they thought. People started getting urinary tract infections, and it was even linked to the death of a patient recovering from prostate surgery. This experiment wasn't even public knowledge until 1976, a full 26 years after the event. Moving on to number 7 now, we have Project MK Ultra. This is a particularly famous one you guys may have heard me talk about in a previous video. During the 1950s and 60s, at the height of the Cold War, the US feared that communist countries were using mind control techniques to brainwash US prisoners of war in Korea. They wanted in on the action. So, in response, the CIA authorized Project MK Ultra in 1953. The secret operation was aimed at developing a defense against drugs or other manipulators that could control human behavior. Such was the secrecy of this project that even today, not much is known about it. But we do know this. The project involved more than 150 human experiments involving psychedelic drugs, paralytics, and electroshock therapy. Sometimes the test subjects were aware they were participating in a study, but shockingly, many did not, even when the hallucinogenic effects started kicking in. Can you even imagine how scary that would be? Many of the tests took place at universities, hospitals, or prisons in the US and Canada between 1953 and 1964. The CIA didn't keep many records though, and any good ones were destroyed when the program came to an official end in 1973. Moving on to number 6 now, we have North Korea. Some of the things we've all heard about North Korea may not be true, but some of them may be even worse than we could ever imagine. In 2014, a former North Korean officer stepped forward to say that the nation's military were using mentally and physically disabled children as test subjects in chemical experiments. He said this was the last straw that caused him to defect and leave the country. The man was called Im Cheon Young, and he said he was taken to special training at the military academy. It was there where they taught him how to confuse the enemy without revealing your own forces, how to carry out assassinations, and how to use chemical weapons. He was close to defecting on this alone, and then came the field learning. This involved testing biological and chemical weapons on so-called objects. At first, these objects were mice, but soon they were using humans. Im said that he saw with his very own eyes disabled people, sometimes children, being killed by these chemical weapons just to show the soldiers how they worked. One expert said this is not surprising. Anyone who visits the capital will never see disabled people because they are allegedly taken away as children and incarcerated in special camps. Perhaps these evil experiments are what the camps are all leading up to. Moving on to number 5 now, we have Project QKHILLTOP. This was a CIA project developed to study Chinese brainwashing techniques, which they used to develop new methods of interrogation. The research was led by a man named Dr. Harold Wolf. Now, he was a researcher at Cornell University's medical school. Dr. Wolf requested the CIA provide him with information on imprisonment, deprivation, humiliation, torture, brainwashing, hypnosis, and more. Based on this, the team began to formulate a plan. They wanted
wanted to develop secret drugs and various brain damaging procedures. According to a letter that he wrote, in order to fully test the effects of this, Wolf wanted the CIA to make available suitable subjects once they had provided these poor souls to test on. Wolf also detailed the next step his research team would take. They would then assemble, collate, analyze, and assimilate the information and will then undertake experimental investigation designed to develop new techniques of offensive, defensive intelligence using a potentially useful secret drug. Basically, the whole thing is just the stuff of nightmares. I have no idea how this got through. Nothing more is really known about the test subjects or victims, as they are often referred to now. Moving up to number four now, we have Dr. Loretta Bender. This doctor has gone down in history for her experiments on children. She was a child psychiatrist who specialized in children believed to have schizophrenia. For almost three decades, from 1942 to 1969, she was a highly respected expert in her field. Her preferred choice of treatment was electroshock therapy. These days, the practice has been banned in most of the world as it's seen as ineffective, cruel, and borderline torture in some cases. Still, this was a different time, and that's what Dr. Bender did to the children. Her methods involved interviewing and analyzing a sensitive child in front of a large group of people. She would then apply a gentle amount of pressure to the child's head. The theory was any child who moved with the pressure was showing early signs of schizophrenia. These days, that's referred to as total pseudoscience, but it took a while to figure that out. By the time her treatments were shut down, Ben had used electroshock therapy on over 100 children, the youngest of whom was just age three. Reports described her as uncaring and the study as unethical. The shocks can cause memory loss, nausea, headaches, jaw pain, or even serious heart trouble, even in kids. Some say all of this was a result of Bender's misunderstood childhood that she had, and she was the product of her own environment and family. Now that is proper psychology, I'm just saying. Moving on to number three now, we have the Burke and Hare murders. William Burke is a guy who has probably tainted my surname forever. Along with William Hare, these two men from Northern Ireland were famous grave robbers in Scotland. One day, an old man they knew died, and to cover his outstanding debt to them, they decided to sell his body for medical science. Edinburgh University gave them seven pounds and ten shillings, a handsome sum in those days. With that, they were hooked. When another associate they knew fell ill, they couldn't even wait to see if he would die, and so they suffocated him in his bed. Again, they sold his body to the university for money. The killing spree began. The pair murdered and sold bodies almost as their full-time jobs. They killed an old grandmother with an overdose of painkillers. Hare even killed his own blind grandson by breaking his back across his knee. Eventually, though, their whole operation was discovered when they got too sloppy. William Burke was hanged in front of a cheering crowd of over 25,000 people. Fittingly, after being put on public display, his body was donated to medical science. Next up at number two, now we have J. Marion Sims. This doctor was once praised as the father of modern gynecology. Now his reputation has been tarnished forever. It was found that he practiced these surgical techniques that made him famous on enslaved women. They included Lucy, Anarcha, and Betsy. The rest of them are unknown. He performed 30 surgeries on Anarcha alone, all without anesthesia. His legacy has long been questioned for the disturbing ethical questions that it raises, especially by those who believe that he used black women as medical guinea pigs without their consent. The Black Youth Project 100, a group of activists aged between 18 and 35, staged protests at a statue of Sims in New York. They wore hospital gowns splashed with red paint dripping down their legs. In a Facebook post, they explained that Sims had purchased black women slaves and used them as guinea pigs for his untested surgical experiments. He repeatedly performed gentle surgery on black women without anesthesia because, according to him, black women don't feel pain. Despite his very inhumane tests on black women, Sims was named the father of modern gynecology, and his statue currently stands right outside the New York Academy of Medicine. And finally, number one now, we have the pregnant women. In January 2018, it emerged that after the Second World War, the US military gave nearly 1,000 pregnant women radioactive iron by their doctors without their knowledge. This was all part of a series of experiments to test the effects. Between 1945 and 1947, researchers at Vanderbilt University conducted this sick experiment that was funded by the US Public Health Service. All of the women were poor and had no knowledge of the experiment whatsoever. Afterwards, they were not even informed that they had been part of the study either. The radioactive iron was given as part of a medical cocktail by health officials that they trusted. Their aim was to record the absorption of iron during pregnancy. However, in the years since then, investigators have said this too was a lie, and that the real reason was for the military to learn more about radiation exposure. In the 1990s, 
Queen's Vanderbilt University finally acknowledged and investigated the experiments. The story broke when two women and one of their daughters filed a lawsuit against the university for exposing them to radiation. One of the women was Emma Kraft. She said at a Senate hearing that the experiments caused the death of her 11 year old daughter due to cancer. The true effects of the study are still being investigated today. Experimenting in at number 10 with glowfish. These cool looking fish are a product of genetic engineering. Zebrafish were the first glowfish available to the public in pet stores, but now there's a huge variety of different type of glowfish on the market. They are available in many different fluorescent colors such as red, green, orange, blue and purple. I love them. I've, I've owned a lot of them, but I don't know if they're actually like the glowfish or just the neon fish. Originally glowfish was created to detect pollution by turning into fluorescent colors, but that didn't work out according to plan. Alright number 9 the transparent frog. This species of frogs was genetically engineered so that we no longer need to dissect frogs. You can clearly see all of its organs, blood vessels and eggs so science classes no longer need to kill frogs in order to dissect their bodies. Students can now observe their life cycles of the frog such as ovulation and also metamorphosis. Now at number 8 we have a micro pigs. A company in China is using a gene editing techniques to create and sell micro pigs as pets. These tiny pigs weigh about 15 kilograms when they're fully grown which is about the size of you know a medium dog. Each micro pig will be sold for about $1500 and customers in China will be able to pick the animal's color and coat pattern because the scientists can manipulate the genetic makeup of the pig. Lactose free milk spills its way into number 7. Scientists have created a genetically modified cow whose whole milk doesn't have the substance that causes allergic reactions in people. I know for me I'm allergic. This milk also contains more casein which is actually a very nutritious protein that is found in regular milk and it has a higher calcium level in it and could improve cheese yields. Getting tangled in at number 6 is the spider goats. Don't worry these animals aren't goat sized spiders because holy shit how terrifying would that be. They are actually genetically modified sheep that produce a spider silk protein in their milk so they are able to use this silk in a variety of ways. It is used for medicine and to create a strong fabric. Landmine detecting plants blows up in at number 5. These plants were genetically engineered to detect landmines in soil by changing color. These plants have the potential to prevent thousands of deaths and injuries by signaling where the deadly explosives are hidden. These plants are sensitive to nitrogen dioxide gas which is released by underground landmines and they will turn from green gas to bright red so you can clearly see it. Next up at number 4 we have the Vacanti mouse. This was a laboratory mouse created by Charles Vacanti in 1995 and it had a human ear growing on its back. I mean ew. The ear was actually constructed out of a cow cartilage cells that was placed into an ear shaped mold and then implanted under the skin of the mouse. The cartilage grew by itself naturally and it was created to see whether fabricated cartilage structures could be implanted into the human body. The Enviro pig comes in at number 3. They are genetically modified Yorkshire pigs that have the capability to digest plants more efficiently than other conventional pigs. The benefits of the Enviro pig are reduced feeding costs and reduced phosphorus pollution. The Enviro pig actually produces 65% less phosphorus in its feces, however, they lost their funding in 2012, so it's no longer being produced. Dropping in at number 2, we have the sudden death of mosquito. A company in the UK has genetically engineered a breed of mosquitoes that is designed to kill other mosquitoes. This particular breed is released into the wild to mate with females in order to transfer a lethal gene which kills the young mosquitoes inside of her so she can no longer reproduce. Scientists believe by doing this they can control the spread of the dengue fever which is a devastating viral disease. Finally number 1 is Dolly the sheep. She was the first mammal to be cloned from an adult cell. She was cloned in Scotland back in 1996 and she lived up until 2003 where she died of lung cancer. She had three mothers. One provided the egg, another provided the DNA and the third one carried the clone embryo to term. I mean is this real? life right now that is insane you have three mothers that is like a lot of birthday gifts and Christmases so this lamb was fertile and had six lambs in total until she died. Mm -hmm.